Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building, Miss Joy 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 Ann Reed. Did I yes, say right? Right. Joy Ann Reed, host Joy of Reed. MSNBC's AM Joy. Yes, and she's got a new book out, "The Man Who Sold America: Trump and the Unraveling of the American Story." Why did you title the book that? Uh, you know, because I think that Donald Trump has been running a, a game on the United States, really probably for. 30, 40 years. Mm. And that game got him to be president of the United States. So I think it was kind of, it's about, it, Donald Trump's presidency isn't a normal presidency. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a continuation of a very long yeah, scam. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a long scam he's been mm -hmm. running and it finally got him the office where he can make the most money because that's what he cares about. It's interesting because people from his own team are talking about things that he said and done, right? Like Cohen, who you yeah. talk about a lot in the book in the beginning. And it feels like it's still, it feels like he really is Teflon. Like no matter what accusations, you know, of sexual assault and of nasty things that he said about ish whole countries, it's like it just rolls off. He can straight up lie about something and say he didn't say it. And then there's a recording of him saying it. Yeah. And somehow it just keeps on pushing. Well, you know what? The reason that scams generally work is people kind of like to be sold. Mm -hmm. And I think that Donald Absolutely. Trump sold, right? People like it. They when you say sold, you mean like sold him a dream. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha. and I think for his base, he's selling them the dream of getting back in America where they're on top. And for them, it doesn't matter what he does. He's saying, I'm going to put you back on top. And as long as you're telling people that, people are going to love him. It doesn't matter what he does. They don't care about that because what they want is to be back on top. This room is what bothers them. Do you think he mm. really wanted to be president, though? Or no. do you think it was just a, a scam to build more press, to make more it money? Was and it was marketing, like... and you said that he wanted to get the hotel in Russia, yeah. and yeah. he felt like running for president was the ultimate marketing scheme. He had been trying to get a a, uh, a tower built in Moscow really since the 80s, since the late 1980s. Why Moscow? Like, what's so important to Russia with him? He's obsessed with these Eastern European former Soviet countries. He's obsessed with Russia mm -hmm. specifically. And it's not clear why that is, but he is. And he wanted to try to impress the government there because you can't build anything there without the Kremlin's permission. So you've got to have the leader of Russia's direct permission in order to build there. So he probably figured, listen, I'm going to run for president. Mm -hmm. puts me on a huge stage. It's going to give me stature. They're going to think I'm important. They're going to give me my tower. And, you know, speaking to people who know him, knew the campaign, were part of it, they were pretty clear that he thought he would get on this big stage, his hotel rates would go up in D.C., he had just <laughs> gotten this new hotel, and it was going to be the greatest marketing scheme ever. And then the thinking is, at least the reporting, um, the predominance of the reporting is, then he was going to turn around and do like a Trump TV, like turn it all into a big media mm -hmm. thing. He didn't think he was going to be president. Right. You said, you said this room is a threat to Trump. Like, do you think hip hop, black culture is really a threat to Trump, the conservative party? It wasn't when he was using it in order to build that part of his stature. Right. Mm -hmm. So according to, you know, people who know Donald Trump, people I interviewed for the book, he liked hip hop culture because he liked the aspect of it that talked a about money. He liked the aspect of it that talked about wealth. He liked the aspect of it that talked about, you know, doing for yourself and being an entrepreneur. He liked that. He doesn't necessarily uh, like the people behind it, mm -hmm. but he liked the idea. Mm -hmm. and so hip hop kind of appealed to him, even though, at least according to Sam Nunberg and other people, he never listened to the music. He just liked the idea. The so flashiness he, of it, too. He liked the flashiness mm -hmm. of it, right, because it's like him. I mean, he lives in gold. He literally moved into gold. He's just like, I want to live inside gold. So that's what his apartment is. Who does he have now for media now that he's not down with Fox News anymore? You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think he needs it anymore. Mm -hmm. I honestly think Donald Trump is his own media at this point. As long as he got social media, he's as fine. As long as he's got social media, he mm -hmm. doesn't really need any help. He, he speaks directly into the hearts of his base. He says wildish though. Like the other day, hey, you don't want to be in cages? Don't come to, don't come here. Like, he says, he if you says don't like it, wildish. And they it's are like so good. Crazy. He's yeah. so inhumane. It's like he doesn't care. And and like it says in the book, he has the capacity to be a uh, caring, and he just chooses not to. He just chooses not to. And the people who love him the most are evangelical white Christians. Mm -hmm. The people who are supposed to live by the red parts of the Bible, where you mm -hmm. care about the poor, the sick, and the immigrant, they they love him more than anybody else in this country because they're the most afraid of, you know, you look around this room, the diversity in this room, that's what America is becoming. Mm -hmm. That really scares a lot of people. They're very, they're frightened of a future in which white Christian men are the minority. Now, you know, white Christians are already the minority numerically, mm -hmm. and they don't want to be, in terms of power, in terms of resources, in terms of the culture, 
They don't want to go into the minority status. They just don't want to. And Donald Trump is saying, I can stop it. He can, but he's telling them he can. So that's the unraveling of the American story. Absolutely, because the American story is supposed to be about all of these new immigrants that come in, make themselves a part of America, and change America for the better and make the culture richer. They don't see it that way. They see the culture as having been the best when they were on top. And the American story has always been just that, a story. The whole concept of freedom, justice, equality, liberty, justice for all, that's never been the story for all Americans. It hasn't. No, but the idea of it has been what's organized the country, right? The, even though it's not been true and people of color, black people in particular, know. We definitely it's know. definitely not been true. But the idea of it, even black people use that in order to build themselves into the into the American sort of concept and say, look, if this is the story that you're telling, we want a part of it. Okay, we know it hasn't been real up to now, but we want a part of it. You're saying this is who America is, then we want to be a part of that too. And that happens for every group of immigrants. They come in, they listen to this story they're told about America being this land of the free and the brave and anyone who has an idea can make it. Okay, fine, we want that too. And the people who were on top say, but wait a minute, you know, you trying to have what we have that makes us unequal. Mm-hmm. And so that's what they fear. And Donald Trump is their leader. Are you ever nervous of doing this book? You're nervous about backlash, nervous about having Donald Trump on your ass? At all? <laughs> no, um, because <laughs> the reality is, if you think about what Donald Trump wants to be versus what he is, like he wants to be Vladimir Putin, mm-hmm. right? If Vladimir Putin doesn't like what you're saying, you go to prison, your head. he can hurt you, yeah. right? Donald Trump really can only actually accomplish what the broader Republican Party already wants. So if he wants to do deep tax cuts, he can do that because that's what they want already. If he wants to put far right wing judges on the court, he can do that because that's what they want already. But what has he been able to do that just he wants to do? Tweet. Not much. That's about it. But you're, you're already a target because you're black. You're already a target because you're a woman. You're already a target because you're a liberal. You're already a target because you're on MSNBC. So yeah. why do you make yourself more of a target by doing this book? Because, you know, I did the book in part because I just wanted to make sure I remember it all. This is happening mm. so fast. What he's doing <laughs> is, ha- right? He's doing mm-hmm. 200 things a day and they're all bad things. Mm-hmm. And then they go away. I mean, this guy mm-hmm. was accused by 20 plus women of sexual that is, misconduct. If that happened to anybody. Right, and if, poof, it's gone. Yeah. And, you said you had two reasons for writing this book, right? One of them yeah. is to record everything. Yeah, just to record it and just so that there's a first draft of history that, you know, for me to remember all the things that have happened. And then I think so that people can get a realistic assessment of what this is. Because I think that the myths about Trump, I mean, he's been telling myths about himself for 40 years and people are starting to believe them. Like this myth that it was the, you know, the broken, you know, man who had economic challenges that elected him. That's not even true. And he's, uh, yeah, he lies about everything. How he got his fortune. Everything. How much he's worth. How much he's worth. Well, he's he's worth a lot now. I can tell you being president, he's making a lot of money being president, which is one of the lawsuits against him. You're not supposed to make money (laughs) being president. And he is. How is he he making money now? Because... I thought he had to get rid of the businesses and do all that stuff. So how was he making money? Everyone else did. I mean, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter had to, you know, disinvest from his peanut farm when he became president. Everyone else did it. Trump just didn't. He's still making all (laughs) of the money. Right. And every time, you know, for instance, all of these foreign leaders, they want to do business with Trump. How do you do it? Check into Mar-a-Lago. You pay the fee. It's $200,000 a year. He doubled the price when he became president of how much it is to be a member. Um, To swipe into his hotel, they upped the prices. So every time a foreign leader swipes their card at his hotel, that's ch- that's money in the bank for him and for his kids. And he's got his whole family working. All of them. They're well all working. Too. He's got them all working. To- <laughs> Everyone's making money. I mean, he's trying to live the way Vladimir Putin lives, where everything that happens in Russia, he gets a piece of that check. Anything that happens business wise, he gets a cut of it. Donald Trump wants to live like Putin. He can't because of some of the limitations on the presidency, but he sure is getting away with a lot. You don't think Trump was elected because of economic anxiety amongst poor white people? No. Really? But the reality is, is I went through all the studies. Mm-hmm. I sat there and read them all. And the reality is, is to the extent that a white American had economic disadvantages, to the extent that they were broke, that produced one of two things. Either they don't vote because poor people don't vote, whether you're white or black. If you're poor, you don't vote. Or they voted for Hillary Clinton. So mm-hmm. the most economically anxious white Americans voted for Hillary. Donald Trump's voters were actually the most affluent out of all of the mm-hmm. voters who voted in the Republican primary. He had the richest white voters, not the poorest. Because you know they, they they know they were gonna get the tax, tax cuts. And they all know that they stuff were gonna like get that. the money. Yeah. And and so he and so poor white people have been taking the mm. L for Donald Trump the whole time, but they're not the ones who put him in. Yeah, it came out yesterday. I think Trump's approval rating is at forty four percent because yeah. people like what he's doing for the economy. What yeah, do, people like well, people think their own economic situation is good. There's also a psychological thing. So even with the economic disadvantage piece of it, if you feel economically disadvantaged, but you think the reason you're economically disadvantaged is immigrants, you mm-hmm. voted for Trump. 
If you know that the reason you're economically disadvantaged is because the corporation you work for shipped your jobs overseas, you voted for Hillary. So even to the extent that you have economic problems, it's who you blame. So Donald Mm. Trump has the people who they see their own economic situation being worse than their parents, but they blame brown and black people. That's more the direction that he that's the kind of people that he got that were economically disadvantaged. So people who love the economy now think they're doing well. But there's even a psychological sort of aspect to that. If you like Trump, there were literally people who hated the Affordable Care Act and thought, you know, the Affordable Care Act was the worst thing that ever happened. The day that he was nominated, those same people turned around and said, oh, the health care situation is great. The they have the it. same health care. Yeah. Yeah. They think it's Trump care now and they think it's great. So people have a psychological connection to him that will make them like something they used to hate because he's involved in it. What do you think is going to happen when they find out it's not the immigrants taking the jobs, but the robots in the future? That's And you know what? Andrew Yang is making that point. Yeah. I think it's a really important point. I mean, I'm glad he's in the race because he's the only one who's really saying it. Eventually, these people are going to find out the real reason that they're in the situation that they're in and that the country is going in these two opposite directions, the very rich and, the, and everybody else. And when they figure it out, we're going to have a problem socially, a big problem, because now when you have the majority of people figure out the real problem, well, who has a plan for that? Mm. I haven't seen very many people that That's have true. a plan for what to do when you have 10 or 20 or 30 million unemployable people because all of the jobs are being done automated. So, I mean, what are we going to do about it? No one is making a plan other than Warren. Mm-hmm. I think Elizabeth Warren is trying to really push and make a plan, but not many people. But what are can you possibly do? You know, when when, when robots are taking over, yeah. it's like, what, what can you do? You build like, a wall around Silicon Valley. You stupid. <laughs> right? I mean, That's what you do. Like, you know, if, if you're from New York, you don't even pay tolls. You don't even see a toll guy anymore. You, no you, more. You drive by. Even if you don't have Easy Pass, they'll send yep. you the ticket regardless. Well, think about if you have to get, like, like repair done or something. You pick up the phone and you have to talk to the computer. Like you have to scream operator it's like four hundred oh, times to get yeah. a person. Oh, representative. Like, representative, right? <laughs> this is me screaming at home. Representative. Says, well, we still need to know what category you would like. Correct. Would you like? It's and it makes thing. you talk to it, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to talk to them. So that means they hire fewer people. The other day I was in Target, twenty seven lines, two open. Right. Yeah. They don't hire people. Out. You have to self check out. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to the point where you know supermarkets are going all automated, meaning you have one person and their only job is to fix the machine if the machine goes down. You can't find customer service anymore. All those jobs are gone. As you mentioned, toll booth collectors, mm-hmm. operators. Now, if you do get a human, they're in Malaysia, they're somewhere else, they're not hiring here anymore. So eventually, you're, those people are not, there's are going to be a lot of people who are just unemployable. I seen yesterday Uber Freight, they're going to start carrying boxes and packages and cars yep. and things like that across the country where there'll be an Uber. Driver, but it will be like I guess like the Tesla will be yep. just somebody manning it from outside. It won't Driverless be cars. Yeah, if you want to get a job, you have to learn how to build robots. You're gonna own and, or repair them, <laughs> yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. by the way, robots build other robots now. People don't build robots; wow. they can build each other. And so the reality is, so Andrew Yang's idea is you're gonna have to do universal basic income. A lot of European economists are talking about this too. Mm-hmm. That eventually you're just gonna have to do what they do in Alaska. Every Alaskan gets a check every month, right? Just for being in Alaska. Because they have to make sure everybody has a floor. So because so much of the oil industry is also automated and they get a check. It's like a dividend for living there. We might have to start thinking about that because you're going to have a lot of hungry, angry people. I just want to point out that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, presented universal basic income for us. It's like to get a black man credit. That's all. And you should get credit for it. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And he, he was saying he could see that, you know, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. But I also think they got to start taxing some of these big businesses that are getting all these abatements and, and don't 100%. have to pay taxes for years. And that's a problem. Well, that's one of the things Elizabeth Warren, right? She's saying that it's not about, and see, the way that um, even people who want to increase taxes on the rich, they've always said on income. Well, if you tax income, think about it. Most people who really make big money, they don't get a W-2 form. At all. They're making their money off of business. Right. So they're not even getting touched by those taxes. So if you do wealth taxes, that means on what you're worth, then you would actually get into some real money and then you could do real things. For now, people. I don't know if I like that because the worth, the, the worth, they always say the worth is more than what we actually have. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And also you can manipulate what your worth is, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on if you have a good accountant. But uh, it's easier to catch people who right now aren't paying anything. I mean, if you think about it, some of these big corporations are paying nothing. Huge corporations making all this money, cutting people's wages, cutting up their benefits, making it harder for people to work, making them work longer hours, not giving people overtime. And then they don't pay anything in taxes. Mm-hmm. That's just unfair. Mm-hmm. Now I have behind the scenes, right? Have you spoken to Republicans who are uh, upset about what Donald Trump is doing but won't come forward because we see what Justin Amash has been saying yeah. about Republicans have told him, you know, good job for separating yourself. Yeah. But 
people are scared to come forward. Have you had any conversations like that? Oh, absolutely. Republicans are like the biggest leakers right now because they want people to know. I think they want for history people to know they, they're not for it, but they don't want to put themselves on the record. They're terrified of his base. I mean, if you think about the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans is the Democrats have a very diverse base. They have to please a lot of different mm -hmm. kind of people, different races, different ages, different regions. The and Democrats, they go in on each other all the time. All the time because they're all they all have slightly different interests. Republicans have a very white you, their base is basically white Christians. And so they're very similar to one another. So they all kind of agree. So they have they, and they're terrified of them. They're terrified of their base. They know if their base, if white Christian men turned on Republicans, they wouldn't be able to win an election. Mm -hmm. So they are so afraid of that base. And though that base loves Donald Trump so much, they'll never publicly turn on him. There'll be one or two, but most of them are too afraid. White Christian men who are so immoral, who lack empathy. It really reminds you of the slave masters using scripture to keep the slaves oppressed. Well, people call it slave master religion, right? And mm. if you think about the way that this country was formed, you had a, a bunch of very rich men. I was thinking about it today. If you go from 1691 all the way to 1776, right? So that that's slavery all the way from that period where all of your tax money from the enslavement of human beings, you had to pay that to the crown. But from 1776 all the way to 1913, that's free. That's tax free money. It's 173 years of tax free income. The amount of wealth this country was able to build mm -hmm. off of oppression is wow. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And it was tax free until 1913. So if you think about the amount of wealth that this country has been able to build up on the backs of other people, that inequality has been built in. And what did they base it on? Christianity. They said, listen, you the slaves had to submit to their earthly masters. God said to. Right. Yeah. And then to in order to, you know, the people who owned slaves and had all that money, they were a minority even among white people. So they had to say to the other white people, well, what can we give you? Because we're not going to give you money. We're not going to give you, you know, wealth. We're not going to give you what we have, but we'll give you whiteness. That's your currency. What we're going to pay you with is whiteness, meaning that you can be the lowest white man, but you're higher than the highest black man. Mm -hmm. And that that's that the wages of uh, of whiteness has been a huge part of the currency, including within Christian America. It's been a foundation of it. So the problem is we have that same kind of legacy even among Christians and they're not letting it go. So what do you think about the whole reparations conversation? Because it sounds like they really do owe. You know, I was thinking about reparations this way. So, so the way you should think about reparations is if I put a gun to your head and I say, build me a house, gun to your head, build me a house. Mm -hmm. Okay, you build me the house. And then I live in the house. I enjoy the house. I pass the house on to my kids. Eventually I sell the house for a million dollars. And then I say, but you know what? You can go. We're even now. I'm letting you go. I freed you. So you're good. We're, we're that that is the conversation we're having mm -hmm. is that we built the house. You know, they got the money. Mm -hmm. They got to enjoy the house, got all the money from the house. And now they're saying it's fair. It's even. It's not even. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about the um, that amount of wealth, 137 years of tax free wealth off of no labor costs, even to feed their employees. They weren't paying. They were feeding them table scraps. That's why we eat oxtail, like Mush. all the food we yeah. eat. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, ain't nothing right. wrong with no oxtail now, Joe. And they're good, but yeah. I mean, we made it good. We made it hot. Like we had to make it hot. We had to do what we had to do. Yeah. You know. But so the reality is, you know, the reparations conversation is about how do you equalize that? Because once you let me go, you took the gun off my head. I'm no longer having to build you the house. I still don't have anything. Right. I don't have a house. And there were still a lot of things that were in place in the system to repress us. Right. From being able to own homes. Yeah. For having businesses. To even take Education. advantage of the New Deal, to take advantage of the the, uh, the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. All of these things that they did to prop up this huge middle class. You know, African Americans were basically kicked out of it and locked out of it. Even unions, you know, this great thing that made the middle class, for the most part, you know, there were violent fights to keep black people out of union. So we've had 400 years of being set back, and now they're saying, but it's fair now. You're free. Mm. You had Obama. It's even. As if they gave even. us Obama. As if we didn't vote right. for President Barack Obama. <laughs> exactly. As if that was a gift. So I, so I, you know, I think the HR 40, I don't know if you guys got a chance to see, that was a great hearing. Mm -hmm. I thought it was important to I have that conversation. Amazing. We need to have this conversation about what do you do? Because by the way, oppressing 13% of your population also holds your country back. Mm -hmm. It holds our whole economy back. And so the things that they've done, not only to us, but other immigrants, but particularly to African-Americans, they have to be addressed. I'm with ta -Nehisi Coates on that. you got to address it. I, so I think we got to have this conversation. I got educated to something because of your Twitter, you and Angela Rye. The slave masters actually received reparations after they freed the slaves. They did. They did. They paid them a reparation, particularly in D.C. and around D.C., Virginia. They said, well, we're going to give you $300 per slave. So they got wow. reparations. Jesus. <laughs> now, now we, what, if you could make a prediction for 2020. Yeah. What do you see happening? <laughs> Right at, at, from where we are right now, what yeah. do you see happening? I would say that if you think about which constituency is the angriest, the hungriest, um, 
the most desirous of change, I would think it would be women. I think regardless of what the polls say, I think that the two women who are at the top right now, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris, I think in a, in a fundamental way they are the front runners. I think it's highly likely that the nominee will be a woman. I think that one of those two is probably the most likely. But who knows, right? Anything right. could happen. Joe Biden has a lot of support, and a lot which, of black folks support I don't understand why. I really don't understand why black people love Joe Biden so much, other than broism with President Barack Obama. Yeah, I think part of it is that black voters are very conservative, small C. They just don't want to take chances. Other, Barack Obama was the only time I've ever seen African-American voters take a chance. Black voters are very dispassionate. They're like, who can win? And I think you talk to a lot of particularly older black folks, they say only a white man can beat this white man. Jesus. And so they believe that the only way to beat Trump is to give white America something, give them Biden, who's also kind of a nostalgia candidate. He kind of goes back to the past, but it's sort of a more sort of positive past for a lot of people. He's nostalgic like Trump is. So do you think Donald Trump will win the second term or no way? It's going to be hard to beat him. I'm just going to be honest. It's going to be hard to beat him. We know Trump is an illegitimate president, though. We keep talking about he won as if there wasn't Russian interference. Yeah. You know? I know. As if Hillary didn't have four million more of the popular vote. Like, why do we act like he just won? Like, You know, I think that part of it is that the, you know, particularly in the media, there is this this normalization process that happens with every president. Um, And he's not the first guy to become president without winning the popular vote. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. our system allows minority rule. We're in minority rule right now Mm -hmm. and and i don't think that anybody has really kind of grappled with that and how severe of a problem that is um that we're not allowing the majority of this country to rule this country so yeah i mean he got in because the electoral college and by the way it could put him back in again what about russian interference though like nobody seems to speak on that a lot we talk about it but it's like no why are we not concerned about that by the way we don't we talk we not only do we not talk about it but we don't talk about specifically in what did they do to interfere Mm -hmm. a lot of what they did was they picked up the idea of voter suppression and took it global. Mm -hmm. A lot of what, if you read the first half of the Mueller report, what they're talking about is the Russians digging in on our deepest, darkest problem, right? Our problem, racism, it goes all the way back to the very beginning of the country, and it's always been the easiest way to get at us. So what did they do? They created all of these pretend black accounts. They went into black social media Mm -hmm. accounts, and they said, Hillary, super predator. Super predator every day, every day. And they just hit on black. It was very much directed at us. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what they were trying to do was get black people to suppress their own votes, to not vote. And it did work. Part of the reason Hillary Clinton lost was that voter suppression wasn't just about putting out her emails. It was about putting out specific emails that would get particularly woke young black folk not to vote. And it worked. I feel like they're doing the same thing now to Senator Harris. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's being done to her now saying she isn't black, Mm -hmm. saying that, you know, she's not really black. Um, I've even seen people questioning whether even the fact that her father's Jamaican, you know, is a question on her. But what do they think black Jamaican came talking from? about her locking up black people for yeah. extended long sentences. Yeah. And she was a pretty progressive prosecutor. Look, we want some black prosecutors. We don't want there to be mm-hmm. no black prosecutors. But that's the way that they're going to hit her. If she's the nominee, it's going to be about, you know, Kamala as a cop. That hashtag was put out. Right. It's going to be about going after her criminal justice. Her husband's background. white. Her hu- the, all of that. And unfortunately, it'll work with some people. And it's, I say it all the time. I, I When I first got turned on to Senator Harris a few years ago, I got turned on to her because of the progressive things she was doing in criminal yeah. justice reform. That's why Absolutely. I liked her. Absolutely. And then I found out she was a woman of, when I, yeah. woman of color. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, she's dope. So it confused me when she announced and it just immediately, cop yeah. this, cop that, check her record. Yep. Like, prosecutors lock people up. Y'all do know that, right? Absolutely. And, and right. And, and particularly in the black community, a lot of the people... You know, a lot of the, the the crime that goes on in our community is against us, mm-hmm. right? So she's also protecting black victims uh, if she's being a good prosecutor in, in her community. So she's got to figure that out. I think one thing that she's done that's been pretty smart has been to take the prosecutor label and turn it on Trump. Yes. That is very smart. She because should the, constantly I, say, I'm going to lock him up. Uh, listen, <laughs> can, can you imagine her debating Trump? I would love it. No. I can't wait. Ooh, I can't wait. Yeah, now, what can America learn from him. South Africa? <laughs> yeah, you, well, have, you have a chapter in the book called What Can America yeah, Learn from South Yeah, you know Africa? what? I, I feel like we, since we are already in minority rule, that's one thing that we can learn is that 10% of a country can forcibly rule over 90% of a country because they did that. Yes, they did. And so as we are already in a minority rule situation, we need to understand it can happen. Um, but f- what South Africa is trying to do is to emerge out of that past to figure out how to allow the majority to rule and still have peace. Um, what A lot of what Nelson Mandela had to do, he had to do because he was afraid the whole world would cut South Africa off. Remember, he was the warrior. He wasn't like people think of him as kind of like a Muppet, you know, mm-hmm. that he was this like really nice guy that just wanted love. No, he was like the warrior 
guy in the ANC. He was leading the, the, the armed wing of the ANC. So he was able to make peace because he was a warrior. Um, but he decided to do it because they wanted South Africa to survive. And, you know, unfortunately, sort of economic racism means that a black owned country is going to have less access to the capital just like we would, you know, less access to the world banking system. So they had to sort of, they had to make peace. They had to do it. And he did a good job of it. Um, but I think in South Africa, they also have done a good job on something we haven't, which is just talking about race. Right. You just talk to white, black people there. They're very blunt about race. They're mm-hmm. very open about their past. We haven't gotten there yet. And we should learn to. America is terrified to have the conversation. 100%. And we can, like, if, I, if I'm talking about something and I use terms like white devil, you know, or cracker ass cracker. And I'm, and I'm talking about racists and bigots. They're yeah. flipping on. They're, why are you saying that as opposed to what I'm actually discussing? Yeah. Like if I, I was telling the story about the guy Elijah who got killed because he was playing his rap music too loud. Yeah. What else is there to call that white man that did that? You know, and the the challenge is that Americans don't want to even put something like that that's a clearly racial crime down to race. Americans are very allergic to talking about race. Mm. It's a weird country that was literally built on racism. Only races. The American system of enslavement was unique in the entire world, in the entire history. There's been slavery going all the way back to the biblical days. But there's never been a specifically race based slavery ever until the United States invented it. Like this country practically invented the idea of racism itself because it was the system that allowed white slave owners and their allies who had no slaves and would never get any to be allied against these people. Because if you think about it, when the U.S. was founded, they had white and black people under indentured servitude. They both were indentured servants. But this idea that uh, that they would take the black indentured servants and say, well, not only are you a servant, but so is your son, your daughter, your grandkids forever. And that you can never escape from being a servant ever. We own your entire family for the rest of your life and their lives. That was invented here. It's something very unique, you know. And so we have to talk about racism. We have to learn to speak to one another without being afraid to because that this country was founded on it. It was enriched by it. You think about the trillions of dollars in today's dollars that were built off of slavery and racism. We have to be able to have these conversations. And you talk about that that currency of whiteness you were speaking about. Absolutely. Like that's I how mean, you keep people feeling like they have a superiority complex. W.B. Du Bois talked about it, the, the wages of whiteness, that you literally say to white Americans, and you know, I, I interviewed Tim Wise, who talks about race. He's a white Southerner who talks about race for a living. This is what he does. No, he's and he's, yeah, and he's like, the way that you get a poor white man to side with a rich white man over the poor black man who re- he really has everything in common with. They both have no money. They both have no resources. They both have no opportunity. But how do you get him to side against the person who he should be allied with? Well, you say you have something over him. Your color, your race makes you more than him. You might own him one day. You don't want to be his ally because you might be able to own him and his kids. And so that sale, I mean, you talk about the man who sold America. These are the men who sold their fellow white Americans on this idea, this racism idea that was completely fictional. But they made it up in order to keep those guys who are the majority from taking over and taking away their wealth. That's why, and this is going to sound crazy, that's why they won't tell us about UFOs. (laughs) I'm serious. Because once they tell us about you, how can you tell a person that they're superior to other people on this planet when you know it's a higher intelligence out there? That's a good point. (laughs) But maybe UFOs are the only things that will save us, right? If there was like a UFO, it will humble everybody. We'd all have to be allies because we got to fight them. That's what like, what was the movie with Will Smith where they had to like fight (laughs) the... Independence Day. Independence Day. Day. It'll be like Independence Day. We'll have to all get together. Absolutely. Fight the alien. Came down and, and messed with Charlemagne. <laughs> I've, I've been abducted a couple yeah. of times, but that's a whole other story. Whole story. We're not here to talk whole about that. Story. What, what will be left of America when Trump leaves office? You if know, he leaves office, well, <laughs> when? Yeah. Nah, all right, nah, let him get another term. He's going to change some things. Don't put that in the atmosphere. Nah, hey, I, I don't put it past him. If he gets another term, by the way, if he gets another term, we're moving. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it'll be. It, I mean, think about Donald Trump having beaten. Um, he doesn't. He's not going to get impeached. It looks like that, that's not going to happen. So he gets away with everything, and then he gets another term. It's crazy. Yeah. So that that Scary. would be. Uh, so I don't know. So I think if he there are two there are two scenarios. If he loses, then I think that the country will try to pretend he never happened. I, you know, it, America has yeah, good amnesia. Moving, right? Yeah. They'll just say oh, that didn't happen, and the Republican treat, Party will pretend like slavery. That yeah. It, it's yeah. Like slavery. <laughs> it didn't really happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. Um, if he wins. It's going to be hard. I mean, if you you think about like supply chains, right? Like, so we did this, these trade wars where we pulled ourselves out of the supply chains for soybeans. So, you know, it used to be that the Chinese bought soybeans from Ohio or Iowa. 
They stop buying it from us because we have a trade war. Do you think when Trump is gone and it's Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren or some other person is president or Biden, they're going to say, OK, we'll take your soybeans again? No, they already bought from someone else. Mm-hmm. People have moved on. Right. And the rest of the world has moved on from the idea of American leadership. We're not going to just get that back. I don't care who you put in there. People have moved on and countries like China in particular have moved up and they're not going to move back. Right. And put us and let us come back. I always the think prime. about that. What do other countries think of us when we have to travel other places? Are we like the laughing stock of the? Yes, we are. The world, unfortunately, very much so. Yeah, I mean, I I've traveled quite a bit since he's been elected, and and people say, you know what? What what one person who I interviewed for the book said to me that was kind of heartbreaking was she said, you know what? We always kind of suspected that what you said about yourselves was kind of a lie. You know that y'all always said that you know you're the great sort of you know, beacon of freedom in the world. And he told us all that stuff. We kind of rolled our eyes. Okay, we listened. Then you elected Obama. We said, you know what? Maybe it's kind of true. Wow, you did something we couldn't do. That's pretty amazing. And now we know it's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump, like, puts the lie to everything every previous president before him ever said about America. Because they're like, you know what? You're no different than us. You know, my father's country had Mobutu Sese Seiko. I compared uh, Donald Trump to him. My father's best friend was here in town. And I said, you know, we have our own Mobutu. And I thought he was going to say, that's ridiculous. You're being over the top. He said, yeah, you do. You know, we're no different and we are no different than anybody else. The scariest thing about Trump right now is people keep calling him dumb. I see somebody that's learning. I see somebody that's actually learning how to really be a president. And that's going to turn into him really being a dictator, I think. Well, the problem is he's not learning how to be a president. President, He's learning that he can get away with anything Mm -hmm. because what he's doing is a scammer. Right. (laughs) And he's not doing anything presidents are normally allowed to do, but he's being allowed to get away with it. The fact that he's getting away with it all, I think he's surprised every day. I think he wakes up surprised every day what he's getting away with. First thing he does is look at his Twitter, I bet. (laughs) I'm sure. Well, that's why impeachment proceedings are so important. Like even He'll never get impeached, but just the fact that you set a president to say, look, this isn't right. Yeah. We can't allow a president to do this. They won't even do that. Well, and if you think about it, the way the country was founded, the, the people who founded the country figured only men like them would ever be president. You know, very wealthy, aristocratic men from a certain class. They never even thought women would vote. You know, they never thought black people would vote. They thought only men like them would be present. They didn't build any safeguards in to stop this country from basically having an autocrat. They didn't put anything in place to really stop him. So, okay, the emoluments clause is in the Constitution. Well, who's going to enforce it? You know, if the Supreme Court says to him, you can't put the immigration question in the census, what if he just puts it on anyway? Who's going to stop him? Like, who actually is going to stop him? My problem is, is that there's no, we think there are safeguards because everyone, you know, even Nixon, went ahead and and if the Supreme Court said you have to do it, he did it. You Mm -hmm. know, they said, turn over the tapes, he turned them over. What if Trump says no? That's what I'm waiting for, is that he just defies the Supreme Court and who's going to stop him? He has said no. Yeah. Yeah. And who's going to, who's stopping him? He makes up all kinds of rules. Nothing Mm -hmm. happens from there. Nothing happens. And that's the problem. The problem I have is he's not learning to be president. He's learning to be an autocrat. In your career as a journalist, would you say this has been the most hectic, busiest time for you? A hundred percent. I mean, and I'm already, I um, have problems sleeping already. I have uh, really bad insomnia. It's gotten much worse <laughs> since this guy's been in because you constantly feel like you have to, it's like having a baby. Like you have to constantly watch them. You know what I mean? With most presidents, you can kind of ignore them most days and, you know, see what else is going on in the world. But then we have to constantly watch them. In. And we see a lot of racism in politics too and in media. So do you feel like that's gotten worse for you also as far as people um, saying negative things about you that are Trump? supporters well and it comes and goes and it's not clear it's all human right so during the 2016 election not just myself but a lot of journalists particularly women journalists and journalists of color black journalists like it was the first time i saw lots of nazi stuff in my twitter feed Mm. and it would be day you know day after day after day and then as soon as the election was over they just went away so i'm not sure those people (laughs) were human right i think a lot of it were just bots so a lot of it is just trying to play with your head. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't that I don't that don't worry about that. You know, I've written columns for a long time and done stuff. So you, you get negative mail. You get I used to actually post my hate mail and <laughs> post it with like correcting the spelling and things like that. I said I just that it makes ignored. people want to send it because they want to get posted. Because they want yeah. th- That's true, too. Mm-hmm. And so people just want attention. And some of it is really just to play with their head. So that doesn't bother me. I don't think it's worse. And, you know, being black, as you know, being black women in the media, yeah. it, it doesn't really change that much. What Donald Trump has done is he's made a lot of the things that people used to think they had to hide now people can be public right people can be open about things they felt that they used to just keep to themselves people don't keep things to themselves anymore i kind of like that like that everybody's so open but then i do wish we would get back to the days when we just all bullshitted each other yeah i don't want to know your religion i don't want to know your politics right Uh, yeah 
and it's got and it's constant and you have to constantly be talking about him and that's what he wants by the way he wants us to constantly think about him and talk about him he couldn't even let when the democrats were in south carolina we were down there they were giving their speeches he couldn't stand it he had to come out and give a press conference and interrupt kamala harris's speech because it has to be about him all the time mm. he can't even he doesn't want to be out of our minds ever because I think he has a, a hunger. I, you know, Tony Schwartz, who wrote his, who really wrote The Art of the Deal, he talks about his father just being this really hard, mean guy, obviously very racist guy, um, but who wasn't warm. And I think that Donald Trump just has a, he's a needy person. He's needy. He needs attention. He, he wants love. He's so jealous that Barack Obama got all this love around the world. He wants it. And he can't mm-hmm. get it. Mm-hmm. Well, the- it's interesting because and even in reading this book when I'm, I'm sure people are going to pick up the man who sold America just seeing everything that happened like just in chronological order all in one space condensed like that it seems absolutely like just numbing that yeah. something like that how how did this even happen when you just read thing after, everything just it's hard and it, it right and just trying to re- even when I was going through it and researching it I, I you you forgot things that happened mm-hmm. you know it's easy to forget yes. what he's doing because he's doing ten thousand things a day I've never seen anything like this like you know I remember when Barack Obama was in and you know I I left media and worked on politics I, I worked on that campaign so I was very proud of Barack Obama being president I thought it was great for the country that he was elected but there were days when he would come on and he would just you know, he, he wasn't like exciting news. Like it wasn't, you didn't have to watch him all the time. Right. Right. We weren't constantly staring at him. He was just being president. And I've, I've, and other than George W. Bush with the war, and we had to constantly watch that, this president sucks up so much of our emotional energy every day, all the time. It's, it's really insane. Do you have any friends who are Trump supporters? I, I don't. Um, no, it, it's funny because <laughs> I have friends who are Republicans. Right. Um, but whether they're public or not, they do not like Donald Trump. They think he's destroyed the Republican Party, um, uh, particularly conservative Republicans that I know um, feel that he's a liar and a scammer. Um, they don't even think he's a real conservative. They think everything that he's doing is a fraud. But the problem is, is that most Republicans won't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. You know? What do you think about his marriage? <laughs> I have... No idea. All I know <laughs> about that marriage is that they're both they share being birthers like they both shared that. And other than that, I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting relationship, I guess. I don't know. Well, the man who sold America. <laughs> yep. Body language. Boy. Trump <laughs> in the unraveling of the American story. Well, we appreciate you for joining. us. Thank Joy you so much. much. I appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right, Go pick up the book wherever you buy books. All right. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. 